Nestle is more famous today for its misdeeds than its overprocessed snacks and drinks. They steal water from third world countries, poison babies, and enslave thousands of desperate people to pick their cocoa beans. These crimes sound more like the pastimes of a James Bond villain who is trying too hard to be evil. But these allegations have been leveled at the chocolate company in just the last 20 years alone. So how did a company which started out making such benign simple products like baby formula end up as a happy face of corporate evil in the modern world? You know, it's funny, you think of you think of Nestle, what do you think? You think chocolate chip cookie, a problematic company, but when you look at their history... That Nestle may actually be one of the worst companies on the entire planet. Legal experts say Nestle and Cargill seem likely to eke out a narrow victory, which would leave other lawsuits in limbo. There's no question they're caught committing fraud, lying to the government, stealing a natural re resource. Chapter 1. Bittersweet Beginnings 1867. Austria forms the Austro-Hungarian Empire after losing to Prussia in the Seven Weeks War, reshaping Central Europe's political landscape into a complex mix of stability and tension. During this era, German-born pharmacist Henry Nestle was making a life in Switzerland, in the French-speaking town of Vevey. With family roots in Swabia of southwest Germany, where Nestle means nest, Henry's upbringing is reflected in the company's logo, a mother bird feeding three chicks in a nest, an homage to Henry and his brothers. Perhaps it was this closeness with his family that spurred Henry to combat the infant mortality rate of the time. His solution was a radical one, baby formula. The invention was a nutritional breakthrough, dubbed farinlecte, meaning milk wheat, because you guessed it, those were the main ingredients, although he did sprinkle in a little sugar for taste. Nestle's commitment to enhancing the quality of life through nutrition quickly positioned Henry's company as a food industry pioneer. Central to the company's philosophy was a dedication to experiment and innovate, even if they weren't necessarily the original creators. Take for instance when Henry's neighbor, Daniel Peter, finally perfected milk chocolate. Having helped him figure out why his mix kept producing mildew, Nestle merged with him. They even teamed up with their biggest competitor, Anglo-Swiss, who, under the guidance of American brothers Charles and George Page, had created condensed milk. Although both of these pivotal moments occurred a few years after Henry had retired, it demonstrates the company's culture for expanding its portfolio by joining forces with allies and rivals. But as the likes of Cadbury's and Hershey's grew into big players throughout the 20th century, Nestle started to incorporate non-confectionary businesses to stay one step ahead. This includes coffee, pet food, soups, noodles, and pasta. But it also includes shareholdings in different industries like L'Oreal and different business approaches in the same industries like Starbucks. Some argue that this shift towards a business-centric approach laid for the groundwork for future controversies. So it's time to learn how history works as we digest the sins of Nestle, the world's most evil chocolate maker. Chapter 2. The Dark Side of Chocolate Grab a bar of Butterfinger or Crunch and you may see the fair trade emblem in the corner. It's supposed to mean that the product was manufactured using a set of commercial norms designed to compensate producers of consumer products by giving them a slightly bigger cut. There's a catch, of course. Fair trade also means the companies themselves get a bigger cut, but that's for another time. All this to say that Nestle's supposed commitment to not screwing their farm workers out of cash seems to fly in the face of reality, especially when some of the workers are children. In fact, it's worse than that. Some of the workers are unpaid children. What's another word for unpaid worker? Oh yeah, slave. In 2021, eight former child slaves in the Ivory Coast brought a lawsuit against Nestle for aiding and abetting illegal enslavement of thousands of children on cocoa farms in their supply chains. That's quite a rap sheet. They were indicted along with the likes of Mars and Hershey, so defenders will say it's an industry problem, not a Nestle problem. When you consider that the Ivory Coast produces 45% of the global cocoa supply, then it seems unlikely that Nestle is more culpable than the other companies. But isn't that passing the buck? Nestle's legal team tried to split hairs by explaining how the child slaves were not used by Nestle, but by their parents. They argued that the parents owned the farms, so if they decided to recruit their offspring for extra hands during a harvest, what jurisdiction did Nestle have? Isn't that like helping your mom and pop at the store during the weekends? Besides, the farmers couldn't afford to send their kids to school anyway, so having more workers just meant the farmers could afford more food, shelter, and other necessities. Right? Wrong. Nestle are the ones who pay the farmers in the first place. If Nestle didn't want their farmers being so broke that they had to use their kids, why not just pay the farmers more in the first place? In 2022, Nestle announced its new plan to tackle child labor risks by promising to close the living income gap, 
Steps like cash incentives for farmers, enrolling their kids in schools, diversifying their income through other farming practices, and, you know, not using slaves. This begs the question, if this is how Nestle is towards its cocoa farmers, is it a surprise how they treat everyone else? Chapter 3. A Thirst for Profit Consider this. Which evil scheme was Mr. Burns most evil? Blocking out the sun to force people to use your nuclear power plant? Intentionally trapping whales and dolphins in plastic rings for slurry? Or using public water supplies in drought-hit areas to charge bottled water hand over fist because you don't think water is a human right? It's a trick question. The last option was too ridiculous to feature in an episode of The Simpsons. Yet, Nestle's former CEO, Peter Brubeck Litmat, said during the 2005 documentary We Feed the World that the idea of water being a public right was an extreme idea that NGOs bang on about. Oof, that's not a good look. Of course, he claims these words were taken out of context. Yet, at the 2000 World Water Forum, he reportedly said access to water should not be a public right. Well, apparently. Despite the widespread use of this quote, concrete evidence remains elusive. Since those PR nightmares, he has stepped down from his role to join the Water Resources Group, a sort of lobbying body that aims to bring governments, businesses, and civil society together with the hope of finding water solutions for scarcity. So maybe he's turned over a new leaf. Or maybe the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. As the world's biggest bottled water maker, Nestle has come under fire for extracting 36 million gallons of water from a national forest in California, despite being court ordered to cut their water use. This was because California was in the midst of a historic drought. However, Nestle did have a license to pump liquid gold from the dry hills of the OC, a license that cost a grand total of $524. That's a drop in the ocean compared to Nestle's revenue streams. The license expired back in 1988. But by regularly paying their annual fee, the U.S. Forest Service considers everything above board. And Nestle says they're not going to stop filling up their Arrowhead bottles from a public water supply anytime soon. Market demand for bottled water keeps going up and up, so it's not hard to argue that it's really consumers at fault. Then again, Nestle even pumped fresh water out of Flint, Michigan, which had been suffering from contaminated water since 2016. It was only a few years ago that the entire city of Flint was exposed to lead-contaminated water. While the residents were living some Mad Max water rationing nightmare, Nestle was pumping out nearly 200 gallons of clean H2O every minute. They did a similar thing in Pakistan, where they took all the good water and left the bad stuff for locals. And all those bottles of water means bottles of plastics. Chapter 4. Bottling the Issue During the 1980s, the idea of plastic water bottles seemed like a passing trend. Surely, no one would pay for anything they get at home for free. Fast forward to today. And bottling water in single-use plastic is big business. It's essentially liquid gold. Yet the cost of a bottle of water is more than a few cents, or a few dollars if you're drinking Fiji. 450 years is approximately how long it takes for a single plastic water bottle to decompose. And that's a conservative estimate. And that's before factoring in the dangers of microplastics. You've seen turtles with plastic beer rings around their necks. Do you really want to see hermit crabs gentrifying coral reefs with their Evian condominiums? But while the other companies are finding ways to become more sustainable, Nestle has been accused of greenwashing. Activists have criticized their waste reduction pledges as mere lip service. The company has made a commitment to make 100% of their packaging from reused or recycled materials by 2025. However, Greenpeace alleged that the only way to achieve this is by fudging the numbers. Instead of doing what they promise, the angry hippies claim Nestle will simply burn plastic waste to make it appear that they've reduced virgin materials, which will contribute more harmful toxins into the environment. That's alarming when you consider how Nestle is the third biggest plastic polluter, with an annual plastic footprint of 1.7 million tons. That's the equivalent of more than 11,000 blue whales. Granted, the winner for most garbage washing up on shores goes to Coca-Cola. But judging from these numbers, Nestle could take home the gold medal sooner than you think. Combine that with the company's stance that drinking clean water is a commodity, and you have a recipe for the most cynical business plan of all time. It explains why their business partners aren't exactly saints. Chapter 5. Stirring the Pot when it comes to bad spokespersons, you've got Subway and Jared Fogle, Hertz hiring O.J. Simpson, and Shamwell being fronted by that guy who, shall we say, did things that we can't say on this channel for fear of demonetization. To be fair, these partnerships were signed before the big-name celebrities found themselves on the wrong side of the law. But Nestle has no excuse for partnering with dictators, because it's not exactly a secret that tyrants are bad people. 
First up, we have ex-dictator of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe. The guy's daily habits included bribery, election rigging, and genocide. He also had a penchant for stealing land during his country's economic collapse, a crisis he caused. Despite the economic hardships, the blood-soaked villain bought his 34th castle. So where was he getting the cash for that? Well, the home of Nesquik had been making deals with his wife to buy milk from one of their ill-gotten farms, specifically 15% of Nestle's total supply. Considering how much cow juice they used for chocolate, ice cream, and baby formula, that's a lot of white stuff. They initially defended their actions by saying the Mugabes were bound to US and EU sanctions, but not Switzerland. They were not, and are still not, part of the EU, so they had no legal obligations to follow suit. That's a technicality. What about a moral duty? They did terminate the deal around 2009, but only after public backlash threatened their bottom line. Not that they learned their lesson. They've been buying advertising slots on the state-controlled media of Belarus, aka the last dictatorship in Europe. It's one thing to sell products in a dictatorship. It's another to fund a dictatorship. This is more than promoting Kit Kats. It's about financially supporting a propaganda machine which routinely coerces political dissidents into making false confessions on air. It is estimated that one out of three commercials on state TV promotes a Nestle product, or Nestle connection, like L'Oreal. To date, the deal is still ongoing. But to add more salt on the wound, Nestle did limit sales in Russia following outcries from Zelensky. But that's a whitewash, because it means they're cherry-picking dictators, and limiting is not the same as stopping. But if you thought we'd reached the pits of their ethics, get ready for this next one. Chapter 6. Penny Pinching Imagine seeing a homeless guy, remembering he owed you 20 bucks when he was on his feet, and saying if he pays up, you'll stick a dime in his cup. That's pretty much how Nestle treated Ethiopia during a debt scandal. Here's the rundown. Back in the 70s, the Ethiopian government was a Marxist regime which nationalized a livestock company named Ethiopia Livestock Development Company. Being good little Marxist, they paid their owner a grand total of nothing. The thing is, this company was a subsidiary of a German firm, which was later bought by Nestle. So when Nestle inherited the claim of $6 million worth of undue compensation, they sued the Ethiopian government years later for a loss of assets due to nationalization. The problem was Ethiopia was experiencing one of its worst famines ever. The country was dirt poor, so it would have less funds to feed millions of people had it paid up. Critics argued Nestle was already so rich that it was, what economists have dubbed, a dick move. Once again, Nestle changed the tactic following public outrage, but only by reducing the debt to $1.5 million, and later offering to reinvest the amount back into Ethiopia as a goodwill gesture. Nestle's PR team said it was never the intention to deprive famine relief efforts from dying people, and that the whole thing was just a standard business practice to clean the air. To them, it was another technicality. If that's the case, why did Nestle kill babies in one of their most infamous scandals to date? Chapter 7 a formula for disaster. To think, the Nestle company got its start using baby formula to decrease infant mortality rates. Now, its reputation has been permanently soiled by using baby formula to increase infant mortality rates. Henry Nestle must be spinning in his grave faster than a Beyblade in a washing machine. Back in the 1970s, Nestle's involvement with Africa took another dubious turn when they used an aggressive advertising campaign to mislead consumers about breastfeeding. Nestle told mothers that their baby formula was actually better than natural human milk, and even had their saleswomen dress up as nurses to hang around hospitals handing out free samples. Maybe without the shady costume shtick, this could have been a good gesture, had it not been for one little flaw. Poverty. Many of these mothers couldn't afford baby formula and already had enough trouble sourcing safe drinking water. They rationed the powder and mixed it with bad water, depriving it of further nutrition, whilst increasing the chance of a vulnerable infant contracting disease. Both of these could have been avoided with sustained breastfeeding. However, weaning a baby back into a nipple is almost impossible once they're taking formula. And that's if the break in behavior hasn't caused the body to cease milk production. The end result? A drastic decrease in natural immunity amongst infants. The World Health Organization calculated that when compared to a breastfed child, Nestle's formula-fed kid died from diarrhea up to 25 times more, and were four times at risk from a fatal case of pneumonia. Overall, millions of babies died. That is not something you want on your Wikipedia page. But Nestle's death count is probably much higher when we factor in their biggest evil to date. Chapter 8. The Ol Switcheroo Remember the TikToker caught licking the underside of ice cream pots? He was convicted, fined, and forced to pay compensation, and had to do community service. 
What about the stories of people deliberately contaminating supermarket items? One guy in England was adding needles into grocery items. Another guy in the US was spraying poison on food. Tampering with items at the consumer level is a huge no-no. We might chuckle at peanut packs warning us that they may contain nuts. But in reality, transparency about content in manufacturing is a food maker's biggest responsibility. Yet in 2014, 10,000 packs of Haagen-Dazs had to be recalled because Nestle forgot to tell anyone it had nuts inside. They even had to recall almost 30,000 pizzas for not mentioning the dough you soy, a common allergen. But if you think such mistakes are inevitable, wait until you hear about how Nestle deliberately switched labels. In China, sales of Nesquik milk powder omitted they used genetically modified ingredients. Nestle protested that they're only required to label GMOs in Europe, but this was enough to be taken to court by angry mothers. So another technicality, huh, Nestle? A similar case erupted in LA for allegedly selling products that claims to have no GMO ingredients whatsoever. The 18-page court filing claimed 43,000 Nestle products used a seal designed by the Switzerland giant to mimic the appearance of the non-GMO project seal. To adhere to the nonprofit board standards, you can't have dairy cows chomping down on modified grain. Apparently, Nestle didn't get the memo. Then again, the non-GMO project isn't exactly consistent with its own practices, nor is it a scientifically recognized regulator. Their own website admits their label doesn't mean a product is GMO-free, and they've been accused of promoting anti-science misinformation amongst the public regarding humanity's only viable technology to ending world hunger. To date, there hasn't been a single death attributed to GMOs. In any case, that's not enough to get Nestle off the hook because their worst mislabeling scandal was rebranding outdated food. 200 tons of powdered milk were decommissioned when the Administrative Department of Security discovered batches produced between August 2001 and February of 2002 were relabeled with production dates to make it appear that they were from between September and October 2002. That means they deliberately tried to get bad baby formula into babies. Once you factor in the child slaves, breastfeeding misinformation, and cavity-causing chocolate, it seems Willy Wonka is much better at looking after children than Nestle. But should they be given another second chance, or are they no different than any other multinational corporation? Let us know in the comments below. And if you want to look at a chocolate maker who also became a conglomerate and made a variety of consumer products, check out our video on the history of the Mars family. And don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.